We've learned how to model motion along a flat surface. In the real world, we often need to consider motion along a sloped surface like a ramp or a mountainside. Suppose you're riding a sled down a snowy hillside. There are three forces acting on the sled. First is the combined weight of the sled and you pulling downward. Second is the friction force pulling the sled backward along the hillside. And finally, there's the normal force of the ground pushing on the sled. The normal force points at a 90 degree angle from the sloped ground. That's why we call it the normal force, not the upward force. Once we draw this free body diagram with these three forces, we're ready to apply Newton's second law. Newton's second law says that the total of all the force vectors on the sled is equal to the sled's acceleration vector multiplied by its mass. Since the sled will move along the sloped hillside, we know that this acceleration vector will point along the same angle as the hillside. This diagram has a lot of vectors pointing in different directions. In fact, only one of these vectors points in the traditional horizontal or vertical direction. We can save ourselves a lot of headache by using tilted axes. Say what? Try drawing a new x-axis that points along the hill and a new y-axis that points perpendicular to the hill. Okay. Still having trouble visualizing this? Yeah, that looks weird. Maybe this will help. Wait, what? Oh! From this view, we can see that the normal force is perpendicular to the acceleration and friction force. This will come in handy for our next step, breaking up Newton's second law into new x and new y components. In the new x direction, there are two forces, friction pulling up the hill and a small piece of the weight pulling down the hill. But weight doesn't go in the x direction. That's why this is the new x direction. Okay, fine. To get this small piece of the weight, we multiply the magnitude of the weight by the sine of the angle of the hillside. So, Newton's second law tells us that the acceleration down the hillside is determined by a competition between the force of friction and a small piece of the weight. If we look at the forces in the new y direction, we see that the normal force cancels the remaining piece of the weight. To get this remaining piece of the weight, we multiply the magnitude of the weight by the cosine of the angle of the hillside. This means we can find the magnitude of the normal force just from the weight times the cosine of the angle of the hillside. Remember how a couple episodes ago I said that the normal force isn't always equal to the weight? There are some cases in which the normal force is not the same as the weight. Well, here's a prime example of when normal force is not equal to the weight. The normal force here equals the weight times the cosine of the slope's angle. This equation for the normal force is helpful since we can use it to determine the force of friction. Remember, kinetic friction is equal to the coefficient of friction times the normal force. Now, when we implement these forces in a code, we'll need to use traditional x and y components. Oh, not again. Here we have the weight vector. Notice that it's pointing directly downward. Next, we calculate the normal force. It has a magnitude given by the weight times the cosine of the slope's angle, and its components are determined by the negative sign and the cosine of the slope's angle. Finally, we calculate the friction force using the coefficient of kinetic friction and the magnitude of the normal force. Notice that the friction also has components determined by the cosine and sine of the slope's angle. After calculating all these force vectors, we add them together in the total force, which will determine our sled's acceleration. Now notice nothing in this force assumes that there's a surface beneath the sled except for our delicately calculated normal force. When we run the code, these three forces conspire to move our sled exactly along the surface of the hillside. In this new version of the code, we've added arrows to represent the three forces on the sled just like in our free body diagram. Notice that if we make the coefficient of friction stronger, we could end up with friction overpowering the weight and the sled will slow down. This means that there's some special value of the coefficient of kinetic friction that will result in constant velocity motion. 
Click the link in the description below to find a set of activities that will help you adjust the coefficient of kinetic friction until you find this special value.